Okay, so in this section, we want to look at how, what are the different ways that we can calculate enthalpy, and specifically enthalpy of reaction, because I mean, in chemistry, we're interested in to know whether or not the reaction is exothermic and endothermic, um, how much energy it requires to occur, that kind of thing. So the first law that we will look at, or the first way to calculate is something called Hess's law. And what Hess's law essentially says is you can take a reaction where you have said, say, A plus B giving C, and then you have, I need to think nicely about this, and you have C plus D giving F. You can sum those two reactions and so we say sum them. That then means that we get A plus B plus D. The C's cancel and we form F. So we're probably interested in the reaction where A, B and D react to form F. But the only thing that we have information about is the previous two. So we, for example, know that the delta RH naught of this reaction is 7 and we know that the delta RH of this reaction is equal to four, uh, 14 whatever doesn't really matter then what we can do Hess's law then says well the reaction enthalpy of this reaction here on the right hand side which is the sum of those two will just be the sum of the other two. So that one, so let's call this one one, let's call this one two, of one plus delta R H two. In other words, this one is equal to 21. And that's what Hayes' law say, states, that you can take, you can sum reaction equations, and then you can also sum their enthalpy changes. Okay, and we'll look at that in this example here. And sometimes, remember, you will prob you could be required to swap around an equation. So, for example, if you had to multiply or if you needed to swap around this equation, then you would have had that it becomes minus 14, and then you also sum it, and then you would get minus 7, for example. Um, that's something we'll look at there. The way that we can express these in a nice summative way, so the, it's essentially the graphical way of expressing Hess's law. So this is like Hess law graphically. Is to use these energy level diagrams. So it essentially says we go from whatever to this, there's intermediate steps. How do we sum all the enthalpies together to eventually get what the enthalpy is for the big reaction? So how does C and O2 form CO2? There are some intermediate steps. We can cancel those reactions and then get the overall one. So that's just um, an example. And of course, this links to the idea of enthalpy being a state function because it doesn't matter what happens here in the middle, it only happens where we come from and where we end up. That's all that matters. And if nothing else matters um, in this world. Okay, so that's what energy level diagrams are. Don't generally need to be able to draw them, but you can quite easily once you have the values. Other enthalpy that we get is enthalpy of formation. Now, enthalpy of formation refers to the energy required to form one mole of a compound directly from its component elements in their standard states. So, what does that mean? This is for typically, for example, hydrogen plus a half O2 gas forms one water, so H2O uh, gas, or liquid or whatever, um, but it forms one mole of the compound. So water is the compound we're interested in. It is formed from the combination of hydrogen and oxygen. 
and this is the balanced equation for one mole to four. Of course, you can multiply this equation by two to get the oxygens half away, but then you form two mole of the compound. So the definition is, what is the energy required to form one mole of that compound? Um, you generally look up these values, the enthalpy of formation, you look up, of course, I maybe just should have mentioned that this symbol here, so delta F, formation, enthalpy. All right, so just that we had for reaction, we had an R, here we have an F. Some things that you can commonly know, the formation enthalpy for something in its um, standard state is zero. So, for example, the formation enthalpy of hydrogen gas, so hydrogen is a gas at room temperature under standard conditions, so at one bar pressure, um, 25 degrees Celsius, hydrogen will be a gas. And that then means that its enthalpy of formation, so how much energy is required to form hydrogen, is zero. So whenever you have a species like hydrogen, it cannot be, its enthalpy of formation is zero. Other things to note, enthalpy of formation values have to be negative for a compound to be um, stable. So there needs to be a release of energy for bonds to form. And if they are positive, it means this compound is very likely um, unstable with respect to com decomposition of its elements. So, for example, it would be if the enthalpy of formation of AB is positive, then it will readily decompose to A plus B, or something like that. And of course, if we can determine stabilities of that, we can use the formation enthalpies to compare the relative stability of compounds. So if something is much more negative than something else, the thing that is much more negative will be more stable. Okay. The nice thing though is, once we have the enthalpy of formation of a compound, we can use that to calculate the enthalpy of reaction. So this weird and wacky equation, or not weird and wacky, it's just something that means the sum. So these sigmas means we need to sum. And the general way, so let's say, for example, we had A plus 2B giving us 3C. Then the enthalpy of reaction for this would be equal to, so it says products, and then we have a NIF. All that means is Ni, so that is the Stoich, and then delta Fh is something you look up in a table. So in this case, it would be 3 delta Fh of the compound C, and then we minus all the reactants. So there's only one A, so it would be 1 times delta F H naught of A minus 2 times delta F H naught of B. Okay, so then we can calculate the enthalpy of reaction for it uh, granted or given these things. And like I said, you'd look up delta F H in a table or an appendix of a textbook or somewhere. All right, so we we'll look at that example in class. So the final question is, can thermodynamics indicate whether a reaction is product or reactant favoring? Now, what does it mean for something to be product or reactant favoring? I mean, let's, let's start with the conversation started there. So reactions that are called product favored have largely converted to products. So the reactants are largely converted to products in reaction, reactant favored equilibrium. So it means you have, that's typically like an acid base reaction. Most of the reactants will be con uh, converted to the products, or actually almost basically all of it will be converted to the product. In another way, then, of course, a reactant-favored equilibrium means that most of the, the reactants haven't reacted at all, so that we have a lot of reactants still left. So 
and only a small amount of product. So history act and favoring. So that's what the, those things mean. So how can we use thermodynamics to determine that? You know, will it be reactant favorite? Will it be a product favoring reaction? And the further question is, will this occur spontaneously? Like, if you mix two things, will they naturally want to react? Or will they just want to like, sort of stay there? So, and this is where common misconception floats in, because you might naturally say that, well, product favored equilibriums will be exothermic because if something is exothermic it sort of just happens you know it, pff, it explodes and it forms the product and if it's endothermic it seems that it's not spontaneous because it needs some energy we need to give it some energy some oomph to get going now though it is true in most cases you would find in most cases that product favored reactions have negative values and the acting favored values have positive values. So in other words, most product favored are exothermic and most reactant favored are endothermic. But there are exceptions. And the reasons that the reason there are exceptions is because delta H is not the full picture. We need something called the Gibbs energy to make predictions on this. And that falls outside of what we're looking at here because we're only looking at the first law. This comes into the second and third laws. Start connecting here. And we also need to look at a quantity called the entropy. And the entropy will dictate to us actually um, uh, what happens. The entropy is sort of, if you want to think about it, um, how chaotic a system is or how chaotic a system becomes. Does it become more chaotic or less chaotic? And it turns out that if a system becomes more chaotic, then it will occur more spontaneously. Um, but it's outside of the scope for this. So that's where we'll leave you. So if you're ever asked and you're only given the enthalpy, can you predict whether or not this reaction will be product favored or reactant favored? Then you say no because we don't have all the information we, we require. We can say a lot about, um, you know, which, where the energy is flowing, because enthalpy connected to exothermic and endothermic, so we can say where the energy flows, and we can look at what the work is or the heat is that's flowing, but we cannot say anything about product favoring or spontaneity. Okay, so that's the last section in uh, this theme. So thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.